uh, Lloyd Braun wanted to do at the time, or the story that I was given was he wanted to do Castaway. And when I went in and pitched, I was told essentially that they wanted something that was as real as real can be. And so they hooked me up with National Geographic and I was trying to justify a tsetse fly in the middle of the Pacific and how a plane could do this and the other thing. And at one point during the process of writing the pilot, I pitched a shark attack. And the executives pushed back and said, well, how often do shark attacks happen? Is this real? And what we want is real, 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 real. Um, and at some point, it just became aware, apparent that um, as things were changing in ABC and, and Lloyd and Susan Lyon were about to be pushed out of there, that they needed not some unknown guy from nowhere, but JJ and so on and so forth. So I left. My joke has always been I was doing Lord of the Flies and they ended up doing Lord of the Rings. Um, so it was it, the, the, I stand by what we were making. I think it would have been really interesting. Um, it was a totally different TV show in the sense that it was it was about restarting society in a world if you dropped off the earth. Now, I admit there were tons of issues that we hadn't solved, and I didn't know enough about TV probably to solve them back then. Like, we were stuck on an island. And could you credibly believe in the world we live in that in a reality-based show, you could live on an island and no one would find you? We since I was very early in the process, we never got to those questions. And I think they smartly said there needs to be more of a conceit here to get around those ideas. And that's, you know, that's where that piece of the show came from. I don't think so, actually. I, I sort of had a parallel career, which is I had gotten started and things were going okay. And, and <clears throat> that happened. And in some ways, I had to emotionally deal with that, right? Um... But I had sort of a parallel track that was going beyond that. So in some ways, um, it used to be people would come to me and say, hey, congratulations on Lost. And I would go into a very long diatribe about explaining my thing and so on and so forth. And then after a couple of years of therapy, I learned to just say, thank you. You know, um, In some ways, because it didn't necessarily propel or hold me back. They were sort of separate ideas. If, uh, uh, soon after that, I had started, I had another pilot made, didn't go, and then I had a show picked up, and I sort of headed down that road. Um, so it's sort of a parallel universe, much like Lost. <laughs> Those shows are kind of, they're both staples of television still, and they're harder and harder to do in a world in which um, you're watching television not... Uh, Thursdays at 8, but whenever you want. And those shows, when you binge them, fall apart pretty quickly because you can feel the patterns coming up and the rhythms. Um, I loved New Orleans. I fell in love with New Orleans. I didn't know it very well. And so that show to me was mostly about shooting down there and being down there and all that sort of stuff and, and trying to find something interesting and real about that world down there that you could put into this sort of box. Um, every, every TV show is kind of a box of toys. Sometimes you have all the toys. Sometimes you have a few toys. Sometimes you have the money toys. Sometimes you have the art toys or whatever. And the trick is just to make the most interesting thing out of the Tinker toys you've got, right? And so that's kind of how I look at things, which is just like all TV, all art, is you have, hopefully, you have some, a bunch, some fun things, whatever they are, and you just try to make them into the most interesting thing you can. But that was, I mean, that was, pumping out a TV show every eight days is, it's kind of grueling. <laughs> I, I love it, but it's um, not for the faint of heart. Um, I mean, you can, it, I, I was trying to run that show kind of by myself. Uh, I had a, uh, I had I never had in place. Um, I mean, I had a wonderful staff of people and so on and so forth, but I never had a really a, a an executive producer structure on that show that helped me. It takes like three people to run a TV show to do it correctly. Uh, certainly, a network TV show where you're on this eight day cycle and you're constantly going over and over again. Um, cable can be easier because you have more time, but it's got its own set of issues. You know, whatever that is. One. Uh, know that you're not expected to do much right off the bat. I mean, you're supposed to soak it up and listen and hear. Um, 
learn to, writer's rooms are, are all about sort of interactions between people. Um, and I think for writers, again, I came from a theater background. I, I came from a theater group. I'm used to groups of people. But a lot of writers are used to just sitting alone in a room and typing. And so the social aspect of that space can be very daunting. Um, and so you have to learn to communicate with this group of people you're working with. And you also learn, have to learn to communicate with the showrunner, which is every so often just to go in and say, what do you need from me? Where am I excelling? Where can I improve? You know, because um, your job really at that point is just to learn the show and learn all the thousands of quirks that come out of being on a TV staff. And I wrote the pilot and then uh, 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 came off it. So Doug Lyman had done a movie called uh, Jumper, which, which is in the same book series as Impulse, which is the second book in that series. And he had felt, uh, I think I'm not talking at school, he had felt that that was not his most successful artistic experience and wanted to really go back and rethink that. Um, and so I had a relationship with them and we started talking about them and I have, I, ha I have an 18, almost 18 year old daughter, 17 year old now. Um, and that project and the one I just finished for Quibi um, called Don't Look Deeper were both about a young woman coming to terms with their, what makes them different and what makes them different being what is, where their power comes from. And so in both those ideas, that was really what just sort of attracted to me to what the story was about. Since after I did the pilot, um, that show has become very much about sexual assault. Um, and I, I've seen a couple episodes and, and the, I feel like they've done a, a, an amazing job of making that what's sort of at the bottom of that thing. The thing I just did for Quibi was really about how, you know, I got a kid, I got two kids um, who have programming, who have machine learning, who have uh, code that we've given them, um, and they are going through this process of trying to figure out what's theirs and what was hardwired and all this stuff. And so this, this thing for Quibi was about the first piece of AI that is indistinguishable not only to you and I, but to them, but to herself. Um, and so it became sort of a metaphor for about that. So um, both those projects came out of, I find, I find I get sort of passionate about stuff and very quickly try to make it a, at least applicable to the life I live or the life I see. And both those projects sort of came out of that idea. The conceit is what is the easy idea to get on an elevator and say, hey, this is what the show's about. And then the character is what makes every episode as interesting as you can.